Beyond Emissions Podcast by Solagent, the largest pure play solar distributor in the Americas. Thanks for joining us today at the Beyond Emissions Podcast right here at the Solagent YouTube channel. Like this video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and comment down below so you can be a part of this ongoing conversation about what it's going to take to create a world that is beyond emissions. Join us as well uh, at Spotify. Beyond Emissions, it's more than just you know, talking about renewable energy. It's more than just talking about what's going on in our world today. It, it, it really comes down to creating the future that we want to have exist. I mean, we talk about it all the time here at the Beyond Emissions podcast. We talk about it all the time that, you know, when Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, that dream did not exist yet. We're, we're in the midst of that dream happening and at the time that he said those words at the Lincoln Memorial, it wasn't happening yet at that time. Same thing right now. We're, we're stating we want to create a world that is beyond emissions. And folks, thanks so much for listening. What does that mean to you? What does beyond emissions mean to you? And of course, here at the Beyond Emissions podcast, we have guests from around the world, customers, vendor partners, engineers, enthusiasts, people who have a passion for clean energy here at the Beyond Emissions podcast, experts from around the world coming on to give their take, not not just about what is a world that is beyond emissions mean to them and, and why. And that's what we ask you every week. What does beyond emissions mean to you? Type uh, your answer down below or go to the Solagent LinkedIn or Facebook page and type it in there. This is what beyond emissions means to me. We want to know. But also as well, how are we going to accomplish that? How are we going to make this dream come true? Technologies, strategies, things that we're doing in the renewable energy space every single day. You, I, our partners from around the world making it actually happen. And it's not there yet. We're not living in a world that is beyond emissions, but it certainly seems that we are on the way. And that's why we have folks on the program each and every single week that share that same exact passion that you and I both have. Uh, I'm Josh Brum, Energy Storage Manager here at Solagent and your host of the Beyond Emissions podcast. Thank you so much for joining us every week and making us number one. We really appreciate your partnership. Speaking of partners, we have a friend with us today, uh, Joel Walsman from Jefferson Electric in I Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, a partner with Solagent. Uh, again, every single day, uh, working towards this mission of creating an emissions-free future. Welcome to the Beyond Emissions podcast, Joel. Hey, thanks, Josh. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, me too. And, and you know, our... Our, our partner, uh, Chris Hamilton, uh, he was telling me about your business and, you know, it, you have that passion, uh, Danny, your whole team, you have that passion at Jefferson Electric. Um, it, you know, you're not just out there making sales, you're doing it for a reason. You, you want to see that world that is beyond emissions as well. I just ask the audience, and I always do, what does beyond emissions mean to you? Uh, how about you, Joel? What does beyond emissions mean to you and your colleagues at Jefferson Electric? Yeah, Josh, I appreciate you asking. Um, that's such a neat question because you can go a lot of directions. Where where my mind goes is I think of so many elements what I value in renewable energy, and one of those is energy resilience. You know, to to name uh, a first, food, water oxygen, basic human relationships, these are all vital needs. And just shortly after that is energy. Uh, we, we live on it, we thrive on it, it's absolutely embedded in the fabric of our life. And energy needs are ever increasing. And I think of the, you know, personally I have eight children, my wife and I have been tremendously blessed, we're so thankful for that. And so being able to secure through distributed generation, energy storage, the, the future of energy, um, a, a measure of resilience for, for safety, security, convenience, and um, that's significant to me. I, I really, that's very important. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. In addition to that, I also, um, the convenience of an all-electric home, the convenience and, and safety, you know, I, I just think of a funny, quick side story, but we all have something along these lines of like, 
Um, my 13 year old daughter was babysitting. She was using someone else's gas stove. She's unfamiliar with, with it. And she left it running, but not lit like pouring gas into the room for like two minutes. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the, the inherent safety of all electric homes and appliances and, um, the convenience of the advancement of technology with monitoring and the ability to, to, to see our energy, manage, monitor, and distribute energy through electric vehicle, both not just charging, but also energy deployment. Um, you have now transportable battery systems. Um, you know, it's just, it's exciting. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's great. I love it. I love what I do. And I get to really kind of geek out as an electrician, a licensed master electrician on the ever improving and advancing technology. And, and one of those excitement, exciting pieces and how I explain it to people is every time your cell phone gets a software update, the renewable energy industry probably just did the very same thing. And, and maybe on steroids, the R and D behind it, the advancement of safety, security, convenience, resilience, you know, the list goes on. It's, it's just really, it's fun and it, it, it's exciting. Too. And efficiency, right? Efficiency. I mean, how much energy does a light bulb burn up now? Uh, you know, as far as actual watt hours uh, is consumed, Joel Walsman with, with us from Jefferson electric right now, the beyond emissions by Sologen podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Like subscribe, hit the reminder bell there in the corner. And comment down below as you're a part of this conversation. But efficiency, right, Joel? I mean, we're talking an LED light right now that only uses maybe anywhere from 6 to 10 watts per an hour used to consume with an incandescent light bulb. Just, I mean, I'm I'm in my late 40s and mid to late 40s, excuse me. <laughs> I'm, But, but I, I look at it and I'm like, I grew up in the late 70s and the 80s and, you know, we had the hot bulb and I mean, that was a 60 to 100 watt bulb and that same amount of lumens or, or light projected um, is, is this, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't cost the same amount of energy or electricity or generation to create that electricity. Uh, not even discussing the fact that the you know energy that's creating that is now clean versus dirty, which it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. What a difference, right? The efficiency of our energy, um, not just the fact that it's safer. Uh, holy smokes, that's a great point you brought up. And I, you know, especially right now, with fossil fuels and you know the cost of deploying and transporting and chemicals seeping out of railways i mean we could go on and on and on about i mean what's going on in russia and ukraine and europe and just the supplies around the world i, I i'm not anti fossil fuel energy we, we never would have re you know reached this point of uh, of technological advancement if we didn't have that as a stepping stone but that's what it was a stepping stone that incandescent light bulb 60 to 100 watts might be 6 to 10 watts now efficiency talk a little bit about that yeah okay so one of my favorite quotes is you know every time we we become very complacent and content with the current condition the status quo and we lose that growth mindset um, I think of the, the quote, <laughs> I think it could be mythical, but it's entirely, um, true of mankind sometimes. Um, unfortunately, and it's this, the U S secretary of the patent office in 1890 something said, I do believe that all things that could be invented have been invented. <laughs> right? Isn't that great? And so when we, um, you know, lighting, to your point, is using 10% of the energy that it was as little as 10 years ago. 10% of the energy consumption for lighting. That's one of the greatest electric loads in any type of dwelling or occupancy is, is lighting loads. And shortly behind that is HVAC. And we all saw the shift to Energy Star appliances. And, you know, those are also ever improving. And so it's fantastic to see that we're able to reduce our carbon footprint and in, in multifaceted ways. And generally, you know, the, the rule of thumb is, is cons, um, the reduction of consumption is more convenient and cost effective than generation as a whole. And so starting with the reduction of lighting loads and LED bulbs is a fantastic place to go with, um, you know, zero emissions future. 
Yes, yes. And you mentioned security as well. Again, Joel Walsman with us from Jefferson Electric in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, here on the Beyond Emissions podcast. Thanks for joining us, Joel. Um, you know, you mentioned security as well in your in your opener here on the broadcast today. Security. You know, I mean, I think you were speaking on a personal level, but, you know, you look around the world right now, our national security, um, the, the, the world reserve currency status of the United States dollar that we depend on for our, our livelihoods um, at the macroeconomic level on a worldwide stage. You've got, you know, China uh, talking to Brazil, talking to India, talking to Saudi Arabia. Since the gold standard was taken away from the dollar, uh, what was it, 1972, I believe, from uh, President Nixon, uh, it's been the full faith and credit of the United States government. But technically, really, it's been the petrodollar, right? The, 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 o- the oil industry, namely Saudi Arabia, only taking U.S. dollars as currency forced everyone else into that dollar trap. They start taking the yuan instead, and we no longer have that security from an economic standpoint. So when you mentioned uh, uh, economic security, it it reminded me of like, wow, if if we took that energy generation and how we run everything, uh, clean uh, clean energy and, and living in a world that is beyond emissions, it's not just great for our local security, but our national security, our economic security. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting when you, look at, as a starting point, when you look at the levelized cost of energy for a, let's call it a homeowner who makes a decision to go with solar over a 25-year period, then typically that levelized cost of, of energy in the state of Indiana is going to be, with solar, is going to be half of what the current utility rate is. And so when we have the ability to fix the cost of living, when we have the ability to um, endure economic crises of various types, when you have the ability to bring um, energy independence to here, because we're in a a global connected supply chain. We experienced that dramatically two years ago, right? And we're still recovering it and it's still complicated, but when we can take a a very significant element of our lives, energy, and we can bring it and we can put it right on top of our roof, our backyard, our business, our schools, and we can secure that significant component right here, that, that level of independence um, is, is fantastic. And, and to me, that's, that's security. Yep. And we don't have to drill it out of the ground, something that took millions of years to get there and then burn it up just one time with negative effects on our environment as well. You only get to use that energy once, whereas renewable energy um, th- there, there are some emissions in regards to, you know, some of the plants that build some, you know, some of the materials, but th- that's one time it gets put on the roof with the energy storage system. And you've got, like you said, 25 years, you own that energy. Now you've got a fixed cost of energy and that's renewable. It's not just being burnt up and put into the atmosphere and you get to use it one and done and have to dig up more. It's doing it again and again and again and again and again. I mean, don't you just love the business that we're in, right, Joel? hundred percent. You know, it's interesting that 99% of solar arrays that have ever been installed on planet Earth since the dawn of time are still in service. <laughs> That's phenomenal. And so, well, you know, if, uh, skeptics and, and maybe rightly so are asking the question at times like, okay, renewable, I get it, but what about the solar panel? It's so big, it's glass, it's got multifaceted components, and there's a cost to recycle. What are we going to do at end of life with all of this garbage that we're generating claiming it's renewable? And my, my bit to that, since we're kind of talking holistically about renewables, is okay, so we have effectively gotten almost universal participation on lead acid battery recycling through pro through through AutoZone and pet boys and all these different places that, you know, we've gotten tens and tens and tens of thousands, maybe more of participants. I mean, every American participates in this program, right? So if we can effectively recycle something as disgusting as lead acid batteries, we can definitely do something like solar panels for as little as probably five dollars a solar panel, we can have an effective recycling program that creates future good 
from solar panels that, again, should last 25 to 50 years. So the, the lifespan is so much longer than the lead acid battery is, for instance. So I think uh, even with a, a, a skeptical approach, it's hard to defend the, the friendliness, environmental friendliness of renewable energy, um, even at end of life. Hey, fun fact, Joel just mentioned it. Uh, Joel Walsman with us from Jefferson Electric, Indianapolis, Indiana, here on the Beyond Emissions podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and comment down below. Be a part of this conversation. Yes, fun fact, fun fact. You mentioned it, Joel, lead acid batteries. That's the business that I was in for almost two decades was mostly lead acid batteries. That's that's where I cut my teeth in the battery business. And there's a fun fact, you alluded to it, the most recycled product on planet Earth, more than aluminum cans, more than bottles, more than anything, more than paper, you name it, is lead acid batteries. Yeah, that's right. That 99% of all lead acid batteries are turned into brand new batteries. And a friend of mine, a uh, mentor, uh, Brian Champlin, uh, in the battery business told me one time, just imagine how much a lead acid golf battery or car battery for your vehicle, how much would that cost if we did not have the recycling regime and programs that exist that make 99% of all batteries recycle into brand new batteries and we had to mine new lead every time. How much would those batteries cost? And that goes to your point. There are innovations happening today. Speaking again to your, the patent office should close back in the late 1800s guy. No, there are innovations going nonstop in this world that is beyond emissions and solar panel recycling. Uh, I, I had a, a friend of, uh, of the show come on, a, a, what was it, a year ago on another version of this program talking about lithium battery recycling, how they've, they, they've, they've got a solution to that where they, they basically put all of the lithium because, uh, again, cells get punctured. You could have fires, et cetera. Well, they actually have this special kind of liquid that it's lithium recycling, I think is the name of the company or uh, anyway, uh, you, you, you actually put it into uh, like a solution into a big vat and, and inside of that solution, it neutralizes any of those effects of fires, et cetera. And you're able to extract out all of that usable lithium. So, I mean, innovations in recycling that people haven't even thought of, um, if we can get Recycling solar panels and lithium batteries, as an example, on parity with what you mentioned, lead acid batteries. Wow. 99% of all lead acid batteries turned into brand new batteries. I think you're on to something, Joel. That is absolutely an unreal statistic. So cool. I'm really glad to hear that. And I, I do think every time there's a human need, humans will solve it. And we've seen that for, for as long as recorded history. So there's no question. Thanks for sharing that. Super fascinating. Oh, it is. And and believe it or not, and by the way, folks, um, if you're in the Indianapolis, uh, Indiana area, Jefferson Electric, I want you to look them up, Jefferson Electric, or click on the link below. I highly recommend you reach out, reach out to Joel and his team uh, for your renewable energy project, uh, whether it includes energy storage or just solar or whatever your need is. Uh, they're great. Uh, but I want to talk about that as well. Um, what you do every single day, you know, uh, you're, you're putting all of these theories into action. It, it's no longer a theory. It's a plan. And, you know, it, it's actually coming to fruition day by day by day. Talk about some of the customer projects that you do. Uh, from Jefferson Electric that is helping us to create this world that is beyond emissions. Anything come to mind? Yeah, great question. Um, I can think of, uh, I'm going to call him Jim, and uh, Jim acquired about 20 acres in rural Indiana and um, created a beautiful setting, and it was very much uncultivated. And um, he had a, a substantial ground mount solar array as well as a climatized battery system. And that was part of his overall um, really profile for life, you know, with respect to he had barns and chickens and goats and gardens and cellar and stream and a elevated retention pond and woodland and was very much had curated a, a uh, almost a entirely independent ecosystem 
um, and uh, created a fantastic area that that he shared um, as a retreat with many people and um, kind of a, a country solace um, to, to get away and enjoy peace and quiet. And that's something that's uh, really, you know, the convenience piece of um, creating a, <laughs> Josh, we might need to edit it. I don't know exactly where I'm going with that. It was beautiful, but I don't know how to convey that, you know, uh, verbally, strictly. Well, theater of the so. mind, I mean, when you think about it, you know, we, we're connected to the grid. We're connected to needing energy from someone else. What you're talking about is the American dream. You're talking about a customer of yours in partnership uh, with Jefferson Electric again. Uh, Joel Walsman with us from Jefferson Electric uh, from Indianapolis, Indiana. This customer of yours, uh, Jim, uh, you know, we're talking about real independence, the American dream, the idea that if 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 you if now it's all math, folks. It's not magic. I mean, I I I will tell you as energy storage manager, I see it every day. You know, I, I want to run my whole house off of uh, batteries and solar. How much? How much? How much? Well, well, let's do a load evaluation, uh, energy in versus energy out, and see what the math says. Um, so it's not magic. It seems like magic, but really, it's as simple as that: energy in versus energy out. So your customer, Joel, who went completely off grid, created their own independent ecosystem. I mean, we're talking about the real American dream, real independence, right? Americans want to be free. We want to be be independent. And it sounds like this customer of yours, uh, that's the path they're they're going down. True independence, uh, not just with their energy, but their whole life, right? Exactly right. Their their food sources and their uh, recreation and um, really was a very holistic plan and he achieved it and, and enjoyed it very much and shared it widely. It's incredible um, to get to share in the creation of, of his long-term dream. And he actually did that at the age of 82 years old. Wow. Wow. You're never too old. Never, never, never say never. That is so amazing. How inspiring. How inspiring. And, you know, by the way, speaking of new technologies, there are new technologies that you deploy and have available. And thank you for working with Soligent uh, for, you know, your products and solutions. We appreciate your partnership. Um, but some of these technologies include the solar panels, include inverters, include uh, energy storage, as an example. You have a myriad of different types of customers with different needs. I, I also hear this all the time. I have a 3,000 square foot home. Uh, I've heard from an expert, and I believe it's true. That's great for sizing carpet, uh, but not energy storage and energy needs. It's all about energy in versus energy out. Uh, you have a customized process when you talk with a customer to, to, to determine what their needs are, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, and, and everybody does ask that question and it's fair. It's like, okay, you have a, you have a car, how much gas are you going to use in a year? And that's the, essentially the baseline question they're asking, which is completely fair because it takes education to ask a more informed question. But realistically, we need to understand what type of car is that? You know, to, to further the analogy, what type of car is it? What are your driving habits? How many miles do you put on a year? And under what conditions are those city miles, highway miles? So it's a bit more of a complex analysis. But um, the, the simplest answer for a homeowner is not what size is your home, but how much energy have you used in the last 12 months? And if that information isn't available, either because there's been a dramatic change, let's say the house has doubled in size and added an electric vehicle on a hot tub, well, now the, the data is no longer relevant. But or maybe it's a homeowner that's new to a home. They've just made a purchase or, or a new build or they're planning a new build. Now that, um, you know, you've got to use uh, some projection techniques and technology to then model with the projected energy usage over a 12 month period. And that's really the most single most valuable um, component piece of information to then designing a meaningful solar and energy storage system for that home. Yes, yes. Joel Walsman from Jefferson Electric from Indianapolis, Indiana, the Hoosier State, here with us today on the Beyond Emissions by Solagen podcast. I, I agree with you, you know, especially when it comes to the solar side. If, if somebody's wanting to get an offset of their average consumption, take 365 days worth of total kilowatt hours used, divide by 365, 
and then maybe add 10, 15% to offset some of the inefficiencies that may be a part of that. Divide by peak hours of sunlight, boom, there's your PV array. That That is fantastic. And now you're looking at other variables when it comes to energy storage. That's that's my that's my game. I do the battery side, and and when it, when you're dealing with batteries, and you still want to have uh, energy resiliency, and you know, uh, I don't know, July or August when you're running the air conditioner all the time, you can't count on averages then. Or if you're going to be off grid, you can't count count on the averages. So for your PV array system, doing the average thing is excellent. Uh, if you're looking to offset your average consumption over the year, but if you're doing an energy storage system, we always want to look at max day use or or average maximum uh, usage, say in a month where you're running that air conditioner. But of course, that depends on everybody's desires or needs. Maybe they don't care about having the air conditioner on those circuits uh, energized by the batteries. Maybe they just care about having fridge, freezer, lights. I mean, everybody has different needs and wants and desires and a different budget as well. But again, it's all math, right, Joel? It's it's all about customizing a system that's right for each individual person, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, you've got to listen. Active listening is the number one sales tool, right? You just have to understand what the objectives are and um, build and size the system accordingly. And some people just want that emergency backup power. You know, I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but... When I need it, I gotta have it. And sometimes it's more fine-tuned plan. And, and you're you're a hundred percent right on that. Um, it, it is math. It's power in, power out. And the magic comes when the because of the unfamiliarity. That's what feels like magic. But really, as the adoption of renewables takes place across uh, the United States at an ever increasing rate, you know, if you don't have a renewable energy system, your neighbor down the road will. And that breeds familiarity, dispels the magic, the math becomes known, and adoption continues to accelerate. I was in Austin, Texas recently uh, for RE uh, Plus Texas in Austin and uh, had an Uber pick me up. And it felt like I was, you know, in space or something. This Tesla pulls up and the X wings rise up and I get into the back and I'm like, whoa, I've, I've never been in one. I've seen one. I love electrical vehicles. I think they're awesome. Uh, my wife and I are waiting uh, potentially for them to switch over to lithium iron phosphate technology or solid state. Um, although, uh, you know, it's a little bit less energy dense. You, you get over to the solid state uh, side of lithium, uh, and we can go into that later. Uh, but anyway, I'm waiting for adoption of, of you know, mostly it's nickel, manganese, cobalt right now uh, because of that energy density. And so for that reason, I'm holding off as the battery nerd uh, on getting my electrical vehicle. But I'm in love with them. Oh, I got in that Tesla, Joel. I cannot believe how it made me feel. Like, I, I didn't want to get out of it. I mean, I, I could have, I, I was just thinking to myself, I want one. This is so awesome. You're driving a computer, but, you know, it's so amazing. Uh, you know, you look back, uh, Thomas Edison created the first electric vehicles, right? With uh, nickel, I think nickel iron batteries. And you would pull up and, and they'd lift out the nickel mm -hmm. iron battery and they'd put in another one and then they'd recharge that up. And so the, and, and so before the internal combustion engine really took off, uh, Edison was producing batteries that had little or no degradation. You had to water those batteries. They, they still exist, nickel iron. It's an amazing product, uh, product amazing technology uh, that Edison created, nickel iron batteries. They're still... World War II nickel iron batteries that are in service today um, in some standby. Wow. Yeah, it's insane because the nickel iron, that's, that's what Edison found was you could go, you could charge and discharge and not degrade the plates whatsoever. So it's like the actual, the jar that it's in or the case that it's in that actually is deteriorating in those circumstances. But the innards themselves don't. I mean, you have to replace the electrolyte every so often. So, I mean, you're, we're not going to see nickel iron happening with a Tesla. We want something <laughs> that's sealed, maintenance-free, right? But, but I got in that Tesla. Let me ask you about that. Uh, Jefferson Electric, Joel Walsman with us from Indianapolis, Indiana with us. My Tesla experience, it made me feel amazing. It made me excited about our future. 
um, electrical vehicles. Um, you have a lot of customers that are, uh, you know, early adopters of electrical vehicles and they have a Tesla of their own. And, you know, how are you working to incorporate systems that help those folks uh, charge the batteries uh, in a timely manner uh, in a home? Because I know there's fast chargers on the side of the road. How exactly from an electrical standpoint are you building those types of systems? Yeah, yeah, good question. And uh, I'll put in a quick plug for electric vehicles as a whole. If you like touching your smartphone, if you like your smartphone, you'll love driving electric because that's the experience. You're exactly right, Josh. When you said, I, I got in it, I love the way it made me feel, and I, I, was, I was being driven by a computer, you know, with human assistance. Like, that, that's the world of electric vehicles, and it is so exciting. So to speak to it, level two charging is that rapid charging at home. Level three is just for public infrastructure. It requires 480 volts, and you can't get that kind of power to a residence except under ultra extreme circumstances. So level two is what you're looking for. You get a full charge and even a long range EV, comfortably overnight, even if it's a short night. And uh, say you're coming in late from being out 11 p.m. and you're leaving early for work, 6 a.m., no worries. You've got a full battery. And, and typically we don't need a full battery every day or a full gas tank. So very convenient, very comfortable. And that uh, level two charging, I'd say the most popular form is the NEMA 1450 outlet. So that is the electrical nerdy designation for what just a big black round receptacle that you find behind your electric range and in other applications that's now broadly used for electric vehicle charging systems in garages. You can put them inside of garages. You can put them on the exterior with proper weatherproofing equipment, um, which is often what's called a bubble cover, so you've got the convenience of that. Um, some of our uh, EV owners have already purchased their second or third electric vehicle, and that third one might be for a teenage child or um, whatever the case is, but EVs, because they're very, uh, there's so much driver assistance, there's so much computerization, they're very safe to drive in so many ways, even beyond standard combustion engines. And so people are selecting them, uh, even though it sounds a little bit maybe high highfalutin to some, for their teenage drivers as a measure to keep them safer. So the integration of multiple heavy electric loads into a home requires some technology, and that technology has come to market, and it's good, so that the energy is being managed as opposed to just building massive power plants to try to meet these needs. There are intelligent ways of meeting the needs um, by managing the energy, um, its source and its uh, destination in a home, even with simple technology. So the installation, I say basic average EV installation um, is uh, about $400 for home charging at level two, and it can increase from there just depending on a variety of factors. Yeah, and if you're only, you know, drawing that energy for four or five hours in a recharge, and generally speaking overnight, right, when, when rates are cheapest, um, mm -hmm. you know, compared to per gallon on gasoline, um, it, there's really no comparison there, right? It's uh, far mm -hmm. less expensive to go EV. That's a completely right. We had one really informed customer who has uh, Ford Lightning, Tesla Model S, had run all the numbers, and he said, my, my gas pickup was costing me about 35 cents a mile. My electric pickup is costing me five to six cents per mile. I'll share at my house, I have a utility rate that's available in Indianapolis. And so when I charge overnight off-peak rate, I literally get 380 miles of range for five dollars that's tough to beat yeah how much gas at how much per gallon would you have to spend and invest for your your trip to be able to get that many miles wow wow oh speaking of um oh jefferson electric joel walsman with us here at the beyond emissions podcast thanks again for joining us joel you know one of the other common miss conceptions about electrical vehicles and renewable energy is we have to sacrifice performance we've got to eat styrofoam you know like we we we, we can't enjoy life anymore uh, everything has to be bland and just nothing but you know hemp drinks drinks you know uh nothing but you know eat beans and rice that's it uh bring bean sprouts you know i mean no 
we're not talking and nothing against if you like bean sprouts god love you i'm, <laughs> I'm but you know what i'm saying like you know uh, uh, back in the day electrical vehicles that's the slow prius that's going 54 in the 65 lane you know that's sticking everyone off with all the stickers on it and and we're thinking Oh, uh, you know, the misconceptions out there. We're thinking, you know, oh, we, if we go EV, we've got to sacrifice performance and power and horsepower and, and speed. And the answer to that is absolutely not. Not only are you helping to create a world that's beyond emissions, not only are you spending less for the amount of miles you drive, drastically less for the transportation in, in your life, um, a, a amazing efficiency and functionality, bi-directional. We didn't even talk about that. I mean, the capability of actually having some backup power in your garage uh, in case the grid goes down. I mean, you don't want to drain it all if you want to drive somewhere, but it's there. It's available. So many benefits. You're driving a computer. It's cool. Oh, man, it made me feel like I was James Bond in that thing. But from a performance standpoint, Joel, talk about that. Electrical vehicles, they deliver power, lots of horsepower from an electric motor. Uh, uh, that, that's a common misconception, right? You're not sacrificing power and performance. You're probably getting more with an EV. Oh, so much more. Okay, so I have a two- and four-year-old daughter. You know what they say when they hop in my Tesla? Punch it, Dad! Punch it! <laughs> the, the kids, the kids love it. It is so. It is such a fun vehicle to drive. And you know what? The, the center of gravity is so low in the electric vehicle because that all those batteries are along the bottom. They're relatively heavy vehicles. Um, so you have a very you have a uh, well landed vehicle, and it's tied around the turns. The performance is phenomenal. So I actually heard of somebody who was being driven by an Uber. Um, and they were in the back seat, and it was going so so fast, so low, so tight that they actually threw up in the back seat. <laughs> they couldn't handle it, and so that's getting a little far afield. None of us have suffered motion sickness, but it you can you can really drive that thing like it's a performance vehicle. There's no question. It's powerful. Oh my gosh! What zero to sixty like that? Like boom! Like three point something? Yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, the, back in the day, I, I, my dad is a master mechanic from John Deere. And, and so I would hang around him and his friends and they'd be working on cars in the garage and talking about this motor and horsepower. And arr, arr, arr. I feel like Tim Allen here from Home Improvement, but more power. Well, believe it or not, you know, the dads and the moms in the future, they're going to be sitting around bragging about the horsepower from their electrical vehicles. Um, it, it's, it's apples and oranges. It's on another level. Can you imagine you're, you're from Indianapolis. Um, are, are, and forgive me. I'm not a, I'm not a race aficionado, but it popped in my head right now, especially with your locale, Jefferson electric in Indianapolis, Indiana, go check them out folks. Uh, Joel Walsman with us here on the beyond emissions podcast. Electrical vehicles, are are you seeing those get entered into races or is NASCAR or the Indy 500, or are they looking to do some electrical vehicles? I mean, I would assume just with the evolution of the internal combustion engine as it got better and more powerful and different fuels, those were added. Um, is racing going to be including or spotlighting electrical vehicles? That's such a good question. Um, does NASCAR have what's called shock series? I think so. And forgive me for my ignorance. I, but yeah, I, I think so. I, and I've, I've definitely seen uh, motorcycle racing um, uh, that is all electric. And I mean, and just imagine that. I mean, it can go faster and the faster you can go. I mean, back in the original days of NASCAR, it was the bootleggers and, and they would soup up their engines and they would make their cars go faster so they could get away from the cops with, with their moonshine as they're going and, and, and delivering their, their moonshine. And so on the weekends, they would go and race those cars that they souped up to go faster. And, and that's the beginning of NASCAR. So you would think that, you know, as you get a vehicle like electrical vehicles that can go faster that would be the natural evolution that someday, I mean, I live in California 
where they're stating their goal is by 2035 that that no vehicles will be allowed to be manufactured and sold in California um, that are not electric or or zero emissions. Hydrogen, that's a whole other program, right? Hydrogen fuel cells. Oh, wow. I mean, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? That That is amazing because now we're not dependent on fossil fuels to derive our hydrogen. It can be done through the electrolysis process. I heard Cummins was starting some electrolysis plants where they could literally take and get clean hydrogen uh, from from a water source. Um, I mean, isn't that an amazing technology as well? No, oh, man. You know, I, th- I heard it said and it resonated and I, I believe it that the future of energy is eclectic and that we'll see many, if not maybe even most, forms of energy generation and storage at play just because there's such a broad range of applications and scenarios. And, you know, when you've got um, high solar radiance, solar is great. And when you've got high wind potential in coastal areas, wind energy is great. And obviously hydroelectric, and the list goes on and on. So hydrogen, I'm completely uninformed. I don't know anything about it, but I have to believe that it's got some place in the future of energy because I, I think many forms of energy do. You're right. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And up until now, the average retort from someone who's just pro-internal combustion engines and thinks that renewable energy is fooey, um, th- their retort usually is, yeah, but you have to get all that hydrogen from oil and, and it's dangerous. And no, no, no. There are technologies right now, uh, metal hydride storage that is able to soak up the hydrogen like a sponge. And when it chemically bonds to this metal hydride, it is no longer flammable. And then you're able to dispense that without losing any energy uh, in its state of just sitting there and it's, uh, you know, on the shelf not being used. It's it, it, zero, zero loss, zero energy loss and, and discharging that electricity as needed. And now on the front end, you're able to create hydrogen uh, from water, H2O, right? Hydrogen is in water. That's part of it. And so you're able to take that out through electrolysis using renewable energy like solar and then f- funnel that into the metal hydride storage mm. that soaks it up like a sponge in a non-flammable fashion that's not dangerous and loses no energy and then discharge it as needed. We are in another place. So, yes, hydrogen, it is going to be a huge form of energy and energy storage um, in our renewable energy future. Or Caltech. Uh, Caltech uh, came out uh, in the RAND. The RAND Corporation in the 1970s studied it, uh, space-based solar. And now Caltech, the Japanese, I think, I think the Chinese are doing it as well. And we've got some things going on, I believe, with the U.S. military uh, on this too, but space-based solar, where uh, up up in the atmosphere, you know, it's sunny all the time. It's it it never gets dark, so that sun is able to be be turned into energy, converted into energy from PV orbiting in certain areas of the Earth twenty four seven. And the idea behind space-based solar is we mm. beam that energy down using microwave radiation. Uh, that doesn't harm any animals or birds flying through or anything. Somehow they're able to shoot it down. Tesla's dream is coming true, isn't it? Wireless transfer of energy. And then receiving it on the earth and converting it, it it blows my mind, Joel, like where we're at. Like we are Mm -hmm. living in Star Trek land. Like, yeah, you, you know, we're in the energy revolution and not a lot of people actually use that term. I don't know that it's widely enough recognized, uh, but the energy revolution is upon us and it has been for a few years now. And that's the, the generation, the storage and the transmission of energy are going to look so different in even 10 years and 20 years than what they do today. It's, it's, I, I think we haven't conceived of how, you know, the momentum that we have presently as a globe, I'm not just even talking about the United States, but as a globe and and how that's going to revolutionize energy over the next 20 years. Oh, and cost, right? Inflation um, as as gas prices and, di- you know, diesel goes up. All of our goods and services are transported around the country um, via fossil fuels, right? I mean, most most, if not all. Imagine, um, you know, you mentioned the cost savings 
of how much it costs to go 380 miles uh, gas versus that electrical vehicle, like cost wise. Um, you know, we're, and we're talking economics, not even the environmental benefits as well. I mean, which are huge, uh, but the, the cost benefits of moving goods and services with fossil fuels versus having that cost reduction utilizing electricity that's produced with renewable energy, especially, right? Um, oh my goodness, that must mean that that can correlate to, if, if it goes in one direction because gas prices rise, then the cost of bringing those goods and services to the store where we go and buy it, it got there from a truck and the gas and the diesel is on the rise. So does our cost of living, uh, inflation of, of, of goods and services prices to us and, 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 and our wallet gets hit. That can work in reverse almost in a sense as well as we make this transition or, or am I crazy? What do you think? Mm, wow. Macroeconomics. Jumping in the deep end here, Josh, it, it does make sense, you know, as, as we're able to do more with less. And part of that's full self-driving. And part of that's the cost of energy storage and generation, the levelized cost of electricity like we talked about. So as a fundamental components, I mean, there, there are very few things in life that don't require energy in some form, even if it's hanging out with friends, right, or they're doing it through Zoom or Skype or something, and that's energy, or we're, or we're transporting ourselves to... You know, everything. Let's just talk about it. You referenced great examples there of, of food and distribution systems. So um, I, you, you sold me. Josh for president. Let's do it. I believe in it. I believe in renewable energy, and I believe that anybody can benefit from it, regardless of what their political persuasion is. Regardless, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if we believe in freedom in America – it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on, your pocketbook, your life, your freedom, your independence as an American is affected by energy cost, by energy production, by energy uh, conveyance. But we, we go into a world of renewable energy, making all of our energy, storing it, and being able to use it for a fraction of the cost of what it currently costs for the same amount of energy. I mean, I love what you're talking about with your car. I mean, literally, I mean, what was it? You said $5 for 300 and something miles. Like that's correct. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's just an example. If we extrapolate that out for, all of the trucks and all of the vehicles that are moving all of the goods and services and the Amazon vans and, and UPS trucks and you name it. I mean, it, I have 10 Amazon vehicles showing up to my door every single day. I'm a valued customer, you know, and I could just imagine that if all of those vehicles, you know, if, if the, if the same amount of mileage that say cost me as, you know, a hundred, $200 now only cost me five or $10 or the company five or $10, that's going to make a domino effect from an economic standpoint. And that is going to affect what things cost us. Um, I, I believe in it. I believe in it, but I also, the name of the show Beyond Emissions, uh, Joel Walsman with us from Jefferson Electric in Indianapolis, Indiana, here at the Beyond Emissions podcast by Soligen. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, my dad, when I tell this story all the time, Joel, my, my dad, when I was a kid, drove me every summer. We'd go up to the Sierra National Forest to see the giant sequoias and camp and about halfway up we'd get above the smog this was in the 80s and we'd look down at the valley of the san joaquin valley and we could just see that nastiness just floating there and hanging there and my dad would stop and put his hand on me and go son if there's something you could do someday to clean that up that would just mean everything to me and i think about that we're we're doing it joel we're, I mean, I feel we are, right? That is absolutely an incredible story. What a, what a uh, gracious charge from your father, and, and, and you picked it up and, and taken it. That is, that's multi-generational. That's how we need to think about every decision that we make, is that multi-generational. Like, you know, are we going to get it perfect today? Absolutely never. <laughs> very, very rarely will we 
will we achieve that today? But when we have a multi-generational vision like that, wow. And he, and he, he gave it to you. He, he gave you the vision. Um, you know, the fact that he believed it was possible in the eighties, um, that was a, that's a very progressive, very meaningful mindset. That's it's, it's, he's a visionary. And so, um, thank you for sharing that. It's very meaningful. It meant the world to me. Thank you so much for saying that. I, I and our listeners, you've got to know that you too can participate in this dream. It takes all of us, right? We all have to get on board with this. Um, and again, whether your uh, your motivation is your pocketbook, or your motivation is uh, multi generational, and you want to you want to take care of planet Earth for our our kids and our grandkids. Or maybe it's you just don't like that ugly smog in the air and you don't like having a dirty environment. I I honestly don't care. Pick one of the above or all of the above because it's all going to be beneficial for you, your family, your future, and our country. We need to do something about this. And I believe, Joel, that we are. And our listeners who are installers and and solar dealers that work with Solagent, just like you guys at Jefferson Electric with your customers every day in Indianapolis, Indiana, we are making a difference. We're we're doing something. And I I love that. I I get to, you, we get to go to bed at night and go, wow, this is what we do, right? That's so true. And you know, the people we work with are on mission. It's, it's so much more meaningful to work in a vocation where you have a mission and not just a job. And so when you get to see the impact, I mean, the, the excitement, I, I, it's, I mean, and this is how the customer expresses it to us. We, we routinely, I mean, I would say more often than not, almost without fail, but when we're completed, we've completed a residential solar, solar plus battery installation. The customer has anticipated this for a long time and it is Christmas day for that customer. They have achieved what, what we've been talking about. They have made um, an impact, a societal impact. It's on their roof, right? But it's a societal impact. And um, they've achieved a dream that maybe it was conveyed to them by their parents. And, and um, But regardless, many of our customers have held a dream for a long time. And, and when we as the solar community, um, the, the installer, the, the contractor side, get to facilitate that dream, and get to be providers of that that tangible good that's going to have a, a long term impact. We're not selling a consumable, right? This is a this is a thirty to fifty year product that's going to have lasting change. It's going to outperform and outproduce itself many, many, many times over before end of life. Um, that is a big reason why the solar community is it's on mission. And and so I appreciate what you're sharing there, and that's definitely the the daily resonance is that it means a lot and you own your energy it's so much just like the american dream with the home ownership right taking someone who's been renting their whole life uh and they finally get that opportunity to to make a down payment and they get approved for the loan and they're with the real estate agent and they're like oh my gosh you mean now the money that i pay down every single month is not just going to a landlord that I could be kicked out next month, but it's actually going into equity for a home that I own. Same thing with energy, right? Instead of renting your power, you now own it, right, Joel? It's 100%, you know, and that if you rent, and we just saw this in Indianapolis, right? The rent went up 12%, bam, overnight. We received an email notice and it went into effect the following month at about Two weeks, heads up, and uh, 12% impact is substantial. And, that, and when you rent, you, you don't control, and you are dependent. And when you own, you control your independence. And the math makes more sense, right? Not only is it the levelized cost of energy with solar cheaper, but you know what the math is going to be. No surprises. And uh, so you're 100% right, Josh. That's a great analogy for exactly what the energy revolution is doing for homes and businesses. Oh, and you mentioned businesses. Yes, you know, most folks just think of the of the system on someone's house giving them energy ownership. But being able to have that levelized cost of energy locked in, you know, you, you, you've got it predicted. Businesses and, and their function 
relies on their ability oftentimes to do forecast to predict you know how much money is going to go out and how much money is going to go in and being able to nail down that cost of business energy and know exactly what it is helps them to do so many other things in addition to providing jobs and more services and more innovations for their customers right yeah yeah you're 100 percent correct um, when you can fix the cost someplace then uh, and schools right uh, they're actually <clears throat> really significant for schools because cost of energy is, is is huge for them not unlike businesses and um, again when you fix that cost and the calculation becomes known predictable without any surprises then you can deploy resources um, effectively other places and I'll share a couple examples um, beyond schools um, section 42 housing right uh, there's government vouchers that are given for energy and those government vouchers come for low-income housing and they are in perpetuity and um, that's that rent check being paid out to the utility but we've seen multiple low-income housing communities go solar to where they have a substantial majority offset of the energy consumed and and that's just money back in pockets and it's the right pockets taxpayer pockets and it's that makes an impact um, and really at this point anybody can benefit from that home ownership equation whether it's low-income housing business schools that have a similar situation are able to put those funds back into education um, that's uh, instead of paying rent the energy revolution be a part of it folks be a part of it if you are an installer or solar dealer around the country join us here just like jefferson electric uh, with Sologen, click on the link below to find out more but if you're in indianapolis indiana or anywhere in that area i highly suggest you reach out to joel walsman and his team at jefferson electric uh, joel this has been a great conversation and i just realized holy smokes it's it's been almost an hour and uh, gosh what a great conversation really enlightening and opening the mind, the cranium, if you will, but opening, energizing, uh, you're discharging knowledge. This is a two-way, bi-directional thing. I, I'm using a little bit of electrical terminology, but uh, I, I'm having a blast. Um, I really appreciate that you have come on the program. Thank you so much for joining forces with Sologent and our and our our team, and and of course your customers. They are the ones that are that are making the decision that help us have jobs in this business doing what we do, right? And it, it takes all of us working together and, you know, let our listeners know, uh, how can they contact you if they'd like to ask any questions ab about our discussion today? But in addition, if they'd like to take advantage of, of the opportunity to join this energy revolution with Jefferson Electric in, Indi in Indiana. Yeah, well, Jess, let me say first, Sologent's great to work with. Your product line is fantastic. Your customer service is really, really excellent. And you are just fascinating, Doctor. I can tell you're, you're not just in the vocation. You're also living it out, and I uh, appreciate that. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Jefferson Electric, you can reach us at www.jeffersonelectricllc.com or you can email info at jeffersonelectricllc.com and our main number is 317-418-3917. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Another gold star show in the can. I, I really appreciate you, Joel. Thank you very much. And likewise, I feel the same thing coming from you. You, you live this. This is not just a job a vocation it's it's a dream it's a mission we're gonna we're gonna change this world now maybe it's my kid maybe it's maybe it's my grandkids but we, we this is going to happen we are going to have a world where energy is abundant it's clean and it's inexpensive and cost of living is going to go down poverty is going to go down we fight all over the world mainly over natural resources the need to fight wars for natural resources going to nearly diminish which is going to increase world peace i know it sounds like i'm saying it's a panacea but it really is beyond emissions means so much and i know it means a lot to you as well so i really appreciate you coming on the program today joel and and the opportunity to work with you in this business sir 
Well, Josh, you're killing it. You and you're simply fascinating. You had a lot queued up and dialed in there, and you just wow, <laughs> like super impressed. I can tell since 1996. You said right? Yep, 1996 when I started uh, in radio, and uh, back when I was a kid in high school. I, I worked at, at Pixley Auto Parts and Farm Supply. My dad, being, being a master mechanic, I would be in there sweeping the floors in his shop. Um, and so a part of my job would be to load up the lead acid batteries, you know, to be recycled, to be picked up by the supplier. And same thing at Pixley Auto Parts. My job was to take them out there and make sure you wash the acid off your hands so you don't get your clothes messed up and all that stuff. But I was able to sit there and go have lunch with the farmers and just hear them talk about stuff like that. And I never dreamed at that time that I would be in the battery business. 1996 comes around and my dream comes true. And I'm doing uh, radio, doing soft rock, 97.1 KSEQ night flights. And, nice. I, and then I ended up doing a classic rock show in Fresno. And, and I mean, my dream came true. And, and then I, I got out of radio because People don't know this, but you don't make a ton of money in radio. And not that money's my thing, but I want to have a family. And I, so I, long story short, I, I get into sales because, you know, that's just something that I did as well, selling subscriptions to the paper when I was a kid. And I just had that knack of selling as well. And so I got into sales. And in 2006, um, I was doing a radio station job, uh, hosting a show, doing live remotes, uh, for businesses and i also sold the advertising as well kind of a multifaceted and marketing doing kind of everything for k-tip radio in porterville california one of the first am radio stations that ever came on the air uh, they were actually on the cover of life magazine like forever ago uh, but way before i was born and i i got a, a job opportunity to go work at a place called battery systems uh, one of the largest battery distributors in, in North America, primarily mostly all lead acid and, and every market, golf, you know, commercial truck, cars, mm. uh, aerial work platforms, scrubber sweepers, you know, that, you know, clean the floors in the malls and the hospitals. I mean, it's down to the little alarm batteries, everything you can imagine. And it was one of the biggest blessings in the world because I, I got the job to do sales as a job. And lo and behold, it put, it's like my basic training. It, that was my college the last 16 years, learning everything about batteries that I could ever want to know. And it oh. turned into this. Now, by the grace of God, I'm the energy storage manager at Solagent, the largest pure play solar distributor in the Americas. And I get to work at a whole nother level of making this dream of beyond emissions come true. So I, I'm just blessed. Wow. I'm just thankful. I, I don't deserve this at all, Joel. Wow. That's cool, man. We just can't see the future and we don't know how those foundation pieces are being laid, but, uh, wow. That's cool. That's, that's a good personal encouragement to me. I appreciate that. Hey, you rock. I, I love working with you and your team and I know Chris does as well. And, um, and uh, thank you very much. Tell Danny, we said, thank you very much for coordinating all this. And, um, we look forward to doing more great things together in helping us create this beyond emissions future, Joel. And, uh, thank you for coming on the program. Uh, hang on the line for our engineer, Joel. Sure, sure. Awesome. Jefferson electric LLC.com. That's www.jefferson electric LLC.com. Go there today. If you are in the Indianapolis, Indiana area, uh, make sure you stop on by, tell them that Soligen sent you. We appreciate you listening and participating with us and, and making this dream come true. Joe Walsman here today from Jefferson electric. Uh, on the program. Make sure you like this video, subscribe, hit the notification bell on the corner, and comment down below so you can be a part of our ongoing conversation about what it's going to take to create this world that is beyond emissions. I'm Josh Brum, your host and energy storage manager here at Soligent, the largest pure play solar distributor in the Americas. We at Soligent are incredibly excited to announce our partnership with GiveHouse. Well, we wouldn't be here today talking to you about Give Power if it wasn't for our partners, Lone Bell. They've been with Give Power since the beginning. Their contribution has given water and light to countless people across the globe. 
We are truly inspired by Lone Pal's dedication to the cause. Something Lone Pal said really strikes a chord regarding gift power, that this is something that's more than money. It's what makes making money more worthwhile. In a lot of ways, that's synonymous with what we're doing here at Solage. Here's how you can help. We've decided to do found Lone Pal's contribution by donating to Give Power on every order paid via our direct pay program to Lone Pal. That's right. Every time your company uses your Lone Pal portal to pay Solgen for material, five people get clean drinking water for a full year. Together we're stronger. Together we can choose to be extraordinary by giving to people who live outside our reach. To us, this means a lot. Solgen's purpose meets Give Power's mission. Join the impact. Solagent Solar Engine. SolarEngineSolutions.com. Go there to find out more. CALSA, C-A-L-S-S-A, stands for California Solar and Storage Association. Join over 700 companies, including Solagent, and become a CALSA member today. Go to www.calsa.org forward slash join and enter Solagent as the discount code and receive 10% off your first year. Membership starts as low as $500 per year and covers you and your entire company. You can pay in monthly installments or once per year. Why join CALSA? For over 40 years, CALSA has been fighting for your rights in California. If you're an installer or contractor in California, it's CALSA working behind the scenes on your behalf to protect the solar and energy storage business you and your companies rely on each day. Imagine the utilities are totally unchecked without CALSA fighting for you. CALSA fights for your rights and also provides resources like direct one-on-one -on -one support from their experts to help you with your questions, navigating everything from NEM3 to battery fire code compliance. CALSA will help you and your company to stay up to date on the latest policy changes that impact the California solar and storage market and your bottom line. Joining CALSA helps to fund their work to lobby for cutting solar and storage red tape, pass pro-solar laws, and to defend your business from attacks. Become a CALSA member today at www.calsa.org forward slash join and enter the discount code SOLAGENT to receive 10% off your first year. CALSA is fighting for you and your business. Join over 700 companies like SOLAGENT and make a difference in the California solar and energy storage market today.